uh, we are uh, um, one minute uh, in advance to the official starting of this uh, um, of today's lecture. So welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to have you uh, again here. So before I introduce the next, uh, the first lecturer of today, I'd like to remind you um, a few rules to interact uh, with the speaker. So if you're following on Zoom, you can post your question in the chat and I'll read it for you, or you can raise the hand going to participants. There are three dots and you can find the button uh, raise hand. And again, I'll give you the possibility to talk and to ask the question. If you are following from the uh, uh, from YouTube, um, you can uh, post question in the chat there. And again, I'll read them for you. So um, I'm uh, very happy to introduce the next lecturer, Marino Gatto. Uh, Marino Gatto is a professor of ecology at the Politecnico of Milan. Uh, he has a research spanned many topics in quantitative e ecology, epidemiology, and uh, environmental modeling. And uh, today is giving the first of three lectures on uh, disease ecology. So thank you, Marino, for being uh, with us. Thank you very much, Jacopo, and welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon for the Italians, and then <laughs> good morning for, let's say, the western part of the world and uh, uh, good evening for the eastern part of the world. Uh, so I will uh, uh, share my screen now and start immediately because time is running. So let me... Share my screen. And um, okay, I see that now there are 79 participants. Okay, great, from everywhere. So uh, actually I'm a professor of ecology, emeritus now because I'm retired. Also I'm still uh, teaching at Politecnico di Milano. And today uh, the topics uh, today, uh, sorry, and also uh, uh, the other two lectures the general topic, models of disease ecology. So today, uh, basics, then macroparasites, and then finally COVID-19 in the third lecture. And you see a simulation of our model here on the left on the spread of COVID-19 in Italy. Um, so first of all, as professor of ecology, let me remind you that uh, porosity is, is a basic ecological interaction. But first of all, sorry, I missed one, uh, one slide. Now, first of all, um, okay, today I will go through the basics. And then on uh, Monday, December 7, uh, I will deal uh, with macroparasites and in particular with schistosomiasis and uh, 9 December, COVID-19. Part of my lectures are coordinated with uh, Professor Andrea Rinaldo's lectures and much of the material, I would say everything with the exception of COVID-19 can actually be found in, in this book, which um, just came out with Cambridge University Press. Okay, so today we are going to speak about uh, basics. And as I told you before, First of all, as professor of ecology, must remind you that uh, porosity is, is a basic ecological interaction. Sometimes people ask me, what, why you're a professor of ecology and, and you're interested in COVID-19 and in the schistosomiasis, how come? But then I must uh, remind them that parasites are everywhere. You have parasites of plants, parasites of animals, non-human animals, and human animals, and so on and so on. So parasitism is basic uh, ecological interaction. And um, that is central in a way to the problem of diseases, even to um, the problem of human diseases. But first of all, let me tell you that uh, actually parasitism is very important even for known human organisms, let's say, but in many cases, many uh, population, even wildlife population, 
are regulated by parasites. This is a very famous example. Uh, many years ago, my good friend, um, uh, Pete Hudson and Andy Dobson uh, came out with this data where you see uh, the uh, breeding hands of, of the red grouse and uh, parasites, this kind of parasites that you can find very interesting. And you see that when the, pop the population is going down and the, the, the parasite load is going up and then the parasite load is going down and the, the population is going up and so on and so on. So there is a large evidence that uh, parasitism is regulating population. And there's another very famous example that of the rinder pet pandemic in Western Africa. Rinder pets was introduced by Italians. You know, at that time, the Italians were dreaming of being a colonial power. And so they introduced domestic uh, cattle in, uh, in Masawa and, and the, these domestic cattle were bringing rinder pets. And this is the, you know, the result. And fortunately, uh, Robert Koch in 1897 found a vaccine. So they started vaccinating. And uh, so they to eradicate rinder pest from Southern Africa, but then only recently they could eradicate um, uh, um, the um, rinder pest everywhere. And the rinder pest was not only affecting the domestic cattle, but also the wildebeest and the zebras and so on and so on. Just to give you an idea of how everything is uh, connected. Now, when we come to um, humans, uh, of course, the kind of um, diseases that are, in a way, let's say, more interesting for ecologists are infectious diseases. And if you look at the um, global death, because you, you see now that most, um, most of the diseases are non-communicable diseases, others are due to injuries, but there is a big chunk of diseases that are communicable, that are infectious. Um, and in fact, uh, if you um, consider, for instance, statistics in 2017, but they're not very much different from uh, 2018 and 2019, the infectious diseases uh, were about 8 million. And just to give you an idea of the importance of and the, uh, how uh, hard the time is, I mean, the time in which we are, we are living, is that COVID-19 has already claimed in less than one year, 1.49 billion deaths. And I think many of you are familiar with the uh, Johns Hopkins um, site where they show uh, the number of deaths and the number of cases um, every day. So we are about now to 1.5 uh, uh, million global deaths. And this is certainly an underestimation probably because the, uh, the global case is certainly an underestimation. This is the global ca the cases that are actually found, but there are many, many cases that are around and they, they, they are not found because they, they do not test that. Okay. Uh, so uh, now, Again, being an ecologist, uh, I'm also interested in understanding. Oh, sorry, what did they do? What is that? Yeah, what, what happened? Uh, I understand that is a. Is, do you see that that red scratch on my screen? Yes, uh, I think you 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 use the pen on the screen. So yes, I see. No, I, I did, I did yeah. have to use the pen. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so if we go to uh, another um, problem for, for, for the ecologist, uh, and that is the fact that uh, now globalization in, in a way and uh, the, the land use change and climate change, they're impacting on everything, but in particular, they're also impacting on diseases. So for sure, habitat change, um, um, agricultural development, for example, which is a good thing on one way, but on the other hand, it is uh, providing uh, more and more uh, um, water bodies, for instance, for some vectors. 
um, of disease. And then of course, globalization of uh, trade and travel allows uh, viruses to spread everywhere uh, very quickly. And if you consider climate change, certainly it is impacting the habitat. So it is making a habitat uh, which was not uh, uh, good for, uh, for, for vectors. Now in, uh, in countries that actually were not favorable to, to vectors, but it also it is also impacting on non-communicable diseases. Clearly, think of heat waves and desertification and so on. So um, the, the, these are anyway uh, global problems, and the, these global problems are heavily impacting also on uh, the, the disease ecology. Now, this is the map that I also usually um, show. Um, to my students, uh, it is a paper which appeared in 2004 in Nature, and you see that I uh, uh, specified in red the name of the last author because this is Professor Fossi, or being here in Italian originally, I mean, the, the Fauci, we would say, and uh, he's the counselor for COVID 19. And he was already pointing out that, uh, that, that there are a lot of um, uh, emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases around the world. And many of them, this is more recent statistics, are zoonoses. Now zoonoses are uh, actually due to pathogens which are usually hosted in known human animals, but they can be transmitted. And they are, they are shown in red and you see how many of them are around. Uh, you see here a picturesque uh, representation of some of, of these uh, diseases. And you see, for instance, the West Nile virus. And if, if you can read that, uh, the usual animal reservoir is various birds, especially robins in the, at least in the United States, and SARS, the original animal reservoir was bats. And then, of course, uh, it's not only uh, humans uh, who are susceptible, but also uh, uh, civets, for instance. Oh, I'm sorry. Whenever I'm using my mouse to point out something, this, this rat, rat scratch appears. <laughs> Uh, okay, so and then uh, the, the, the bird flu, for instance, uh, waterfall and Ebola, again, various bats, uh, and so on and so on. Okay, uh, Jacob, can, can, can I get rid of that red scratch? I'm, I'm not sure how to uh, get rid of that. Uh, I'm perhaps a... I don't know because usually, you know, I, I think if you press the uh, so probably if you go, uh, let me Because see. usually I should use, if I use annotate, but I'm not annotating. Yeah. I don't know what happened. Because you, when I use Zoom with my students, that, yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I can move my cursor and uh, that's sure, it. Uh, um, Maybe, no, you see, wow. Because there is annotate, perhaps you have, if you go to view option on Zoom uh, on top, you should probably see annotate. Yes, but I didn't use annotate. Uh, so let me stop annotate maybe. Mouse, okay. Okay, now it shouldn't, okay. Now I can move the mouse. I cannot get rid of that scratch, unfortunately. Okay. I'm sorry. I'll okay. try to, to solve this. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Jacob. Yeah. Sorry for this. Okay, now let's uh, go deeper into, into the problem and also into the problem of, of modeling. And okay, uh, first of all, a big uh, distinction which was made um, many, many, many years ago, uh, basically by um, uh, Anderson and May, Bob May and Roy Anderson, uh, in terms of modeling is the difference between micro and macro parasites. Uh, so 
Microparasites um, are uh, typically viruses and, uh, and uh, bacteria, and they have a short lifetime with respect to um, the uh, lifetime of host, of, the, of their host. So in a way you can neglect the dynamics uh, of the, um, uh, the microparasite load inside the host, also because it, it would be almost impossible to count all the parasites inside a host. And in any case, their dynamics is quite rapid. So what you do usually, uh, you do another approach, you use compartments for uh, the host and distinguish susceptibles, uh, infected, and so on. We will see that. Microparasites instead, you see an example there, they have a lifetime which is comparable to uh, the lifetime of, uh, of their host. So you can include, uh, and you must actually include the dynamics uh, of, the, um, of the parasites. Um, okay, and now macroparasite would be the object of my next uh, lecture where uh, we will uh, see the detailed model of, um, of schistosomiasis. Okay, now if you consider now microparasitic diseases, first of all, we should distinguish, because we must use different models, the transmission pathways of microparasitic diseases. So, first of all, you have direct airborne or um, sexual um, transmission, that typically the cold, the measles, SARS, COVID 19, influenza, and so on. Then you have vector-borne diseases. These diseases need a vector. Without that vector, the disease will not be there. And then typically you have malaria or dengue, Zika. And in many cases, they are uh, uh, transmitted by mosquitoes or by flies and so on. Then waterborne diseases. This in this case, propagules are transmitted via contaminated water. So you, you drink a contaminated water, for instance, to get cholera or, or rotavirus. Uh, okay. And then there are other diseases that we'll, we will not treat, environmental diseases. You mean that the propagules can uh, stay in the environment for the long time, so you can get infected by uh, contacting those uh, propagules with very long, long time. So typically uh, anthrax, for instance, or tetanus, that kind. And then sometimes we also have a vertical, uh, vertical uh, transmission uh, so from mother to uh, their progeny. And so for instance, HIV can be transmitted um, from the mother to the children or hepatitis B and C. We were mainly dealing uh, with direct uh, vector-borne and waterborne diseases. I will not talk about environmental diseases and I will never consider vertical uh, transmission. Uh, just uh, a hint to uh, let you understand is that the life cycle of, of uh, macroparasites and then uh, we will leave the, the topic to the next lecture. Here is a very simple life cycle. Usually macroparasites, the, um, the adult stage of the, um, the adult reproducing stage of the macroparasite is inside the host. Uh, so uh, look at that pig on, 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 on the left. So it is ingesting uh, eggs uh, or the macroparasite that eggs will develop will go to the lung and then will go to the guts and then uh, the adult worms will reproduce and then they will uh, produce eggs and the eggs will be defecated into the environment and the same pig or another pig can get infected and reinfect. Another cycle, and that's important because the, for instance, schistosomiasis, which I am going to speak about is of that kind requires a second uh, host. Uh, so typically, for instance, in uh, uh, fasciolopsiasis, uh, uh, the, again, the adults are inside the host, uh, then they uh, produce eggs, the eggs are shed into the aquatic environment, they develop into a stage which is called mirasidium, 
But that mirror serial must uh, have these nails in order to stay inside the snail and create the other stage, the cercaria stage, and then the cercaria will uh, actually swim into the water. They can uh, also penetrate the skin or be ingested, and the cycle goes on. Vector-borne diseases, just to give you an example of very many kinds, okay, malaria, typically, Chagas disease, sleeping sickness, fever blindness, and so on. And then waterborne diseases, uh, uh, cholera is probably the, the most famous waterborne uh, disease. Here, for example, the country is reporting cholera in this um, five-year period. And, but then you have many other typically uh, diseases which involve uh, diarrhea. And uh, many of these diseases, unfortunately, are uh, a leading cause of death among children, typically among children under five years of age. And, and so the diarrhea diseases are fifth among the leading causes of death. Now, um, what are more diseases uh, and cholera? This is the topic that will be dealt with um, by uh, Professor Rinaldo in um, his third lecture. Okay. And today I will mainly introduce the basics to you. Now, are there any questions uh, after this brief introduction or not the brief introduction? Not in the chat and not on YouTube. So if anyone has a question, please uh, don't hesitate to write it in the chat or to raise hand and um, in person. Of course, this was very basic and uh, probably many of you already know the, the topics. But... Yeah, I think uh, we can move forward and... Uh... Okay. Something emerges, let me know. Great. Now, uh, today I will go into the basics, but let me remember that actually the aim is to go into more complicated models than the models I am uh, actually introducing today. And that the common spatial setting of this model will be networks. And the next lecture you're going to have today is about networks. So uh, the basic idea that you, for instance, for waterborne diseases, you might describe the um, hydrology of body water, but you can transform, and that would be the topic of the next lecture by Professor Rinaldo, uh, that, uh, that into a simplified network, a graph where you have nodes and where you have arcs and arcs of course are the connection. Now, they are more complicated models. For instance, if you consider uh, a different kind of transmission and uh, not uh, only due to, um, to water, then you might have a graph, which is not a tree, uh, but a more uh, complicated graph. And uh, you may, may introduce connectivity matrix, matrix matrices uh, that might be stochastic matrices or stuff stochastic matrices and so on. But not only that, in many cases, you have more than one network uh, to describe the disease. So uh, for instance, uh, in, in uh, uh, cholera, which is going to be described by uh, Professor Rinaldo, but also in schistosomiasis, so when I think about, uh, these are uh, diseases that are connected to water. So you have the hydrologic transport, for instance, but you have also human mobility. And so um, in, in that case, you have a double network. And in some cases, uh, you make the nodes coincide for the two networks. This is sort of approximation, uh, locating the cities or the villages at the same node where you have the nodes for the ideologic transport, for the ideologic network. But in other cases, like this example, um, this is the um, model of schistosomiasis we developed for Senegal. 
In that case, you have water points, you have villages, and that, that's interesting because we have phone antennas because we, we can actually develop the um, uh, uh, mo human mobility connectivity matrix by using mobile phone, but then the antennas are not uh, located only in villages, for instance. And then you have water points. So in a, a water points are where the people can get infected. So in that case, you have multiplex networks. Okay. In any case, in each node, you need a local model. Okay. Suppose that now all the connections are, uh, for instance, cut. You got all the connection. You can see only one village, and you you try to develop a model for the uh, a disease um, uh, in in that in that village, and then you, you will uh, connect. The, the, the nodes in the network. Today, I'm going to speak about the local models. And uh, please, um, I think that, forgive me if you already know, because it, that would be very basic. But on the other hand, I, I think it's good to have a very basic notion. Okay. So, if when you consider local models, possible approaches are either you might have uh, compartmental models. So, for instance, we would see that for uh, a microparasitic disease with direct transmission, you can distinguish between susceptible, infected, exposed, infectious, recurrent, and so on. A macroparasite uh, model, we might consider the parasite load. Usually, in, in these cases, what do we would use ordinary differential equations, but you can also develop stochastic uh, stochastic models typically when for instance you have only a few cases and then you cannot make uh, the approximation that use uh, real numbers you must use integer numbers so uh, five infected people uh, okay so uh, when you go to of course to a small numbers the stochastic effects are very important Another possible approach, but I will not use that, is through a uh, distributed infection period. So you don't consider just compartments, but you use, for instance, the age of infection as a continuous variable. In that case, you must use partial differential equation or integral differential equation. But that is an approach I will not use, and I think, and uh, not even Professor Ronaldo will use, I think, that kind of approach. Okay. So let's start with now with the, uh, the, the real the real models. And um, uh, we'll start with microparasitic models with direct transmission. And the simplest model is uh, the one where you can see just the susceptible people, people who are not infected but might be getting infected. Oh, sorry. And uh, um, then you have another compartment, which is the compartment of infected and infectious people. And then, oh, and then uh, there is no in, in immunization. So these infected people will practically have no immunization and go back to being susceptible at a certain rate. Then, a more realistic model is the one where you consider the recovered people. So these people are recovered and are immune, at least for a while, then they might uh, lose their immunity and go back to being susceptible. Or they might have a permanent immunity, in that case that these, oh, this arrow is not there. Or finally, you must distinguish between infected people, but not yet infectious, and people who are infectious. So this is, for instance, the typical case of COVID-19. So in COVID-19, you have some people who are exposed. They are not yet infectious. That is going to last about five days in the average. And then you get infectious. And then you can infect, uh, of course, the susceptible, then you, you can recover, uh, you certainly part of people recovering COVID-19. We don't know whether they get some sort of immunity. 
for sure some immunity. Uh, we don't know how long uh, it is going to last. Maybe one year, maybe two years, maybe three years. Okay. And these are called SEIR models. Now let me go into the, the simplest um, um, SI model because in any case, it is a very good example to start with. So the basic SI model, uh, you have susceptibles and these susceptibles can reproduce. So you have a birth rate. Well, even the infected people might reproduce, but let's suppose that when you're infected and you have a disease, well, you, let's say that you will not reproduce, you, you will be in a, in a bed and uh, you don't have time to, to reproduce. Okay, so let, let's make the hypothesis that this is not there. Then there is a, a certain mortality, you is a natural death rate from other causes, or causes other than, than, than the disease. And then you have a certain infection rate and um, so susceptible people can get infected then this infection rate. And then you might have uh, that, uh, that the in infected people recover, but then they go back to being susceptible because there is no immunity or it is very, very short. When you go to the in infected people, of course, this rate will go into the infected people and then the infected people might die from other causes, die because of the disease or recover and go back to being susceptible. Now, a very important distinction is related to the infection rate. But now before doing that, let me introduce some terminology. Incidence. Incidence is a flow, is the flow of newly infected. So remember, it is not a number, it is a number per unit time. So you might have, so the number of positive slides of people or with that you, uh, they make a test and they know that, they, that you have malaria. Per week, per week, that's the incidence. Prevalence is instead of fraction, it is uh, the ratio between the infected people and the total number of people susceptible plus infected. Now, a big and important distinction is in terms of infection rate. Now, what is the infection rate? It is the probability per unit time that one susceptible gets infected. So if you examine that probability, you see that it is actually the product of three different things. So first of all, the contact rate, in order to, uh, uh, to, to be infected, you need to contact people. So you have number of contacts per unit time, uh, given a certain number or density N of individuals, both susceptible and infected. But of course, only if you meet the infected people, you get infected, so you multiply by the prevalence. But then, even if you meet um, uh, an, infected, uh, an infected guy, then you might not get the disease. So you must multiply by a probability of becoming infected and infectious. Now, we will suppose that it is constant, but in reality, in reality, it depends on the behavior. So for instance, if you wear a mask um, and then you will not get um, COVID-19, okay? Uh, or it is very difficult, especially if you, if you, if you wear an FP2 mask. Just, so, but anyway, let me suppose that it is a constant and so it gives a parameter that can, um, can vary. Then, the, what makes a difference in the contact rate? So uh, the contact rate, number of contacts per unit time might depend uh, as a first approximation, if you consider so-called density dependence uh, might be proportional to the density of people. So if you stay in an, uh, in an environment with a, uh, a lot of people surrounding you, uh, the contact rate will be higher 
and, uh, and just the opposite. But for instance, if you consider a sexually transmitted disease, you don't get a sexually transmitted disease by going in the underground uh, and being surrounded by people. Okay. So in that case, this is called frequency dependent. Uh, I is proportional to I divided by N, the prevalence, because the, the contact, uh, the contact rate uh, in a way is kind of constant. So uh, with density dependence, I, is, uh, small I is proportional to capital I, that is called the law of mass transmission. And uh, with frequency dependence, uh, the uh, infection rate is proportional to the prevalence. Now, both assumptions are unrealistic because if you are in a desert, you can have a, anyway a sexual intercourse. Okay, you are alone. <laughs> so, even uh, when you consider uh, sexually transmitted diseases, the, of course, the concept rate must go to zero uh, when N is, is, uh, goes to zero. And on the other end, even uh, with airborne transmission, even if you go in, in a Say in a very crowded underground, you're anyway surrounded by no more, let's say, than 10 people. So even uh, um, airborne uh, uh, transmitted disease can actually saturate to a maximum rate. Okay. Now, let me start now with density dependent transmission. And uh, uh, um, what I call Malthusian growth. So let me consider now. Uh, a simple case in which I is proportional, uh, the infection rate is proportional to capital I, the number of infected. So you have a very simple uh, um, multiplicative term. I'm sorry. Oh, when I move the mouse, sometimes, you, you know, I switch from one slide to another slide. So you have a term like that, which goes into here. Now, let me su suppose that to give you the idea of the ecological importance of the, of the diseases, that, that uh, this population, if there is no infection, would actually grow in an exponential way. Now, if you now introduce the possibility of infection, what comes out that if you study now these uh, nonlinear equations, and I think that you have a, a, a tutorial on nonlinear analysis. So these are the, the, you see the Isaac lines, okay. And uh, you see that now there is a known trivial equilibrium, this one. And uh, therefore the main message is that disease can regulate the population. A population that will grow exponentially does not grow actually exponentially if uh, a disease is introduced. Now, another result with very important result is that the prevalence of the disease decreases with the mortality alpha due to the disease. That's another very important message. So uh, diseases that are very lesser a very low prevalence, fortunately. So, uh, so for, you consider Ebola, for instance, very, uh, very lethal disease prevalence is, uh, is low, fortunately. Okay, but not mean that. Of course, you can go into a more realistic uh, uh, model. And uh, uh, it's one uh, where the susceptible cannot grow in, indefinitely if there is no disease, they cannot grow exponentially. Uh, I, I hope that you're familiar with the uh, logistic model. Uh, it is a model where the population would grow to what we call a carrying capacity, K, um, if there were no infection. Now, you introduce uh, um, now um, an infection, and what comes out is that if you do a nonlinear uh, analysis of, of that nonlinear model, you now have three equilibria. The trivial equilibrium, uh, no susceptible, no infection, okay, population is not there, or no infection, population goes to the carrying capacity, so that's a second equilibrium, or third possibility, there is an infection and that infection actually creates a, a third equilibrium. Okay, so this one is the, what we call the disease-free equilibrium. And this is a non-trivial equilibrium. 
However, that's a very important message. If you go to the expression of that non-trivial equilibrium, you find out that although this isocline will anyway intercept this red curve, which of course extends also to negative numbers, the negative numbers do not make any sense because you cannot have a negative number of infected. So if you go into the mathematical expression, it turns out that that mathematical expression makes sense, meaning that this guy here is larger than zero, is no negative, only if this, of course, if capital K is larger than mu plus alpha plus gamma divided by beta. And in fact, you see that, for instance, suppose that uh, we um, uh, increase, we consider a disease with a larger alpha. Uh, into, uh, and uh, you have the same carrying capacity, same population, then another disease, consider another disease with a larger alpha. So this isocline will move. And now you have a situation where there is no intersection. Now, this is an example, I don't know, Jacobo, whether it was a tutorial on nonlinear analysis of a transcritical bifurcation. So, in that case, uh, the uh, non trivial equilibrium will actually disappear, let's say, actually, not true. Uh, it will go down here and become unstable, and uh, the uh, disease free equilibrium will become stable. So we can use linearization and eigenvalue criteria, but basically when um, the non-trivial equilibrium is no longer feasible, you have the transcritical bifurcation. Now you can write this condition in an equivalent way, which is very important because it introduces one basic notion, which is now very popular, the basic reproduction number. You can write, the inequality in this way by introducing what? What do we call the basic reproduction number? And you can interpret the basic reproduction number. Um, uh, by the way, it was introduced by demographers one century ago, but this um, concept can be act actually um, translated into, um, into epidemiology, it is the average number of secondary infection caused by one primary infection in, an health, in a healthy population of carrying capacity. Now in demography, it is the average number of daughters produced by a mother in the course of its lifetime. So here you have mother infection and daughter infection, exactly the same concept. And why? Well, it's very simple. One divided by my, uh, mu plus alpha plus gamma is the mean resident, it is a time, and it is the mean residence time in the infectious compartment. So the, inf the infected stay infectious for such a time. And beta K, now the susceptibles are carrying capacity. So it is a healthy population. Now, beta times K is the number of susceptible infected per unit time in a disease free population by one infectious individual. But that guy would stay infectious for this time. So, this is exactly the average number of secondary infection caused by one primary infection. And if he is larger than one, then the disease can increase. Otherwise, the disease cannot increase. So the disease cannot become endemic. So if are not, if more than one, the disease free equilibrium is stable, you have a transcritical bifurcation and the disease cannot become endemic. Are there questions now? Because that's a very important concept. Any question on uh, or not?
there are not questions. Sorry, wow. Now, there are two possibilities that everything is very clear or everything is very obscure. <laughs> Hope well, that the first option is the right option. Okay. We'll see. Now, you can go to more realistic models. So, for instance, suppose now you consider a more realistic contact rate. Well, it is very simple. Instead of uh, uh, beta times k, uh, since the contact rate now is n divided by delta plus n, you simply have beta k divided by delta plus k multiplied by the residence time. Okay. But now there is one interesting thing. Suppose you have what we call a frequency dependent disease, for instance, uh, uh, syphilis, and you don't get syphilis by going into the underground. Oh. So now th this delta is really very small, let's say close to zero. So if it is close uh, uh, to zero, you see that, uh, okay, now delta cancels and you have beta k divided by k, you end up with the uh, an R naught, which is approximately beta divided by mu plus alpha plus gamma. So it does not depend on the carrying capacity. So you see a basic message in, 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 uh, in, in this case, and even in the previous case with density dependent, that R naught is larger if K is larger. So it is, uh, easier to uh, get any in a, uh, airborne transmission in New York than in, uh, say, uh, in the wildlife uh, of China. Okay, or uh, clearly. Okay. Um, while if if you have uh, other diseases, sexually transmitted diseases, you see that K is not playing a role. What is playing a role is the probability of, of the, the, the beta probability of getting uh, uh, infected and uh, the times one remains in, in infection. So, for instance, for AIDS, uh, that you cannot AIDS by going around, uh, uh, you can remain infected for quite a very long time, actually. And then, of course, you might go into more complicated model, but not so complicated, where you also consider recover. And so, for instance, uh, okay, with um, this is with uh, recovery or not as this uh, expression. So you replace this gamma, which is the rate at which you become susceptible again with actually raw the rate at which you recover and go into the uh, recover compartment, but it's basically the same. Now, an important message, however, for the remainder of, 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 the, of the course and of the lecture, that it is possible to generalize these machinery for network models where you don't have just the two uh, ordinary differential equations, three ordinary differential equations, and so on, but you have a, a system, for instance, of ordinary differential equations, uh, where each local model is connected to another local model by a network, possibly a multi-network, a multi, a multiplex uh, model. But you can still use you know, linear analysis, bifurcation theory. And the important concepts of dominant eigenvalues or the spectral radius of appropriate matrices. And in this way, it is possible to introduce generalized reproduction numbers. So for instance, the general reproduction numbers that which, might, which might be the spectral radius of an appropriate matrix. Okay. And so to uh, decide whether the disease can become endemic or cannot become an endemic uh, based on that uh, analysis. But the, let's say that the, the basic idea in the way is, is uh, the same. Now, to finish, uh, just uh, give me five minutes and then uh, I will be finished. I want to briefly introduce without going into the details, um, uh, Marino, sorry, since we are switching here, uh, if, uh, if you want, there are two questions on R0, so. Oh, great, okay. Uh, 
So there is one question by Zored in the Zoom chat asking, is our not time independent? Okay, now that's very good. <laughs> A good question. Okay, now by R not, please note the zero and the not. This is the basic, the basic, okay, basic reproduction number. So it means that you consider a healthy population. So nobody cares about that disease. Then the infection appears and, uh, and there is no treatment and people are not wearing masks and so on and so on and so on. Okay. And then you must decide whether that disease will actually become endemic or not become endemic, possibly spread. Okay, so that's the basic reproduction number. And now I know that it is very popular, another reproduction number, which is called RT, T. So RT is the average number of secondary infection caused by one primary infection at time T, when the disease had already spread into the population, but now uh, people are being treated, our people are being isolated, uh, people are taking precautions and so on and so on. Not only that, but also the prevalence of the disease is not one. Because in the basic reproduction number, the prevalence of the disease is initially one. Nobody is infected, well, with the exception of say one infection, few infections, you can approximate. Okay, so uh, then beta might be time dependent. K, which is the number of susceptible people at the very beginning might be replaced by the number or the density of prevalence of susceptible people after a, a while. Also, uh, now, so consider also recovery. So there might uh, people um, who recover and if they are treated, the rate of recovery is going up. Okay, and so on and so on. So in that case, you can introduce what is called RT. So the number of secondary infection, not at the very beginning, that's the basic reproduction number, but at time T. Okay, uh, I hope I answered the question. No, there's a second question, Jacobo. I don't remember. No. And, sorry, there is a, actually a question from YouTube. Um, Vibuti is asking um, actually a, a broader question. How, can you explain how a disease does not become endemic? Um, a disease does not become endemic? Yes, I'm not sure if it is a question about uh, interventions or uh, is a question about uh, uh, the stochasticity involved in the... No, I mean, I mean uh, okay. Uh, well, okay, there's a problem with stochasticity. That's true. Okay, that's very, very good uh, remark, Jacobo. Of course, this is, everything is based on a ordinary differential equation model where uh, these S and these I are treated like real numbers. But in reality, okay, if you consider, for instance, uh, uh, initial, initial infection, now you should consider a stochastic model where the number of infected people can, is an integer number actually. So it is true. Whenever we say one infection here, okay, we are using an approximation. We might, in, in mathematical term, we should say epsilon with epsilon is more. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's more appropriate to think of S and I in terms of density. So say number of people per square kilometer, number of susceptible people per square kilometer, number of infected people per square kilometers, so that's a real number. So I cannot really think of 
one so one is one infected guy per square kilometer no we mean a very small density of infections initially so it is true that in order to understand whether that disease can actually become endemic you it might be necessary to use a, a stochastic approach at the very 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 beginning but if we make a deterministic approximation then this kind of r naught is um okay it, 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 the, the one is the threshold for r naught for the disease to become endemic uh meaning that the only stable equilibrium in the long run will be the disease-free equilibrium okay so even if if oh i'm sorry oh i'm sorry okay so um suppose that now um, um that now we are at carrying at carrying capacity uh, at carrying capacity um and then you put a it's a, a a number of a, a small number of uh of, of Sorry, I made a mistake because this should not point here. This should should point to kept. Ah, okay. I'm sorry. I think I made a mistake in, in creating the the, the the this graph. Um, okay. So in, in reality, so you um, when this isoclane is here. So I made a mistake in the. You're right. So uh, I'm sorry. I think I should. I think I can correct this, but to correct that. Oh, no. I'm correct that. No. So in reality, the, no, I'm sorry, it's not this one. Oops. Okay. So it should be okay. Okay. I'm sorry. That was a mistake. No, not this one. Okay, I think you understand now. I, I know. So uh, that and in that case, uh, even if you introduce a few infected, uh, a few infected people, then the um, the 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 um, pop the the population will we go to the disease free equilibrium that is the sense okay so true there might be stochasticity um and second uh, of course you have some infection initially even if r not is more than one but that infection will die out okay in the, at, even in the deterministic model I hope I answered the question. Okay. Can I go on for? Uh, two more. Uh, there are two more questions, uh, but uh, perhaps it's better to ask them uh, at the end. Okay. So uh, now let me go on um, just to introduce uh, the the the. The, the model waterborne diseases, uh, in a way, that is um, important. Uh, actually, um, you see the, uh, in a way, the best known uh, disease is cholera. Uh, the the pathogen was actually discovered by Filippo Pacini in 1854. And you know, see that here, the basic um, eco-epidemiological model is, is, is the one where you introduce another compartment, that is bacteria in the aquatic habitat, because uh, you do not usually get infected uh, uh, by contacting infected people. Well, it can, can happen sometimes, but you, you get infected by, for instance, drinking contaminated water. And so the infected people will actually contaminate the water. So there will be bacteria in the aquatic habitat and then the uh, susceptible will actually get infected because they drink contaminated water with bacteria. So the uh, basic water disease model is, is one where you have now you simplify the logistic growth by um, 
thinking of a demography which is close to carrying capacity age. So you can linearize and weigh the uh, logistic model around uh, the carrying capacity, let me go that carrying capacity age. And then you have a model which is similar to the one that you saw before with the difference that now the susceptible people get infected because they get into contact with bacteria. So this term, we go into the infected compartment. Okay. And then uh, uh, did, uh, that suppose that some of these infected actually recover and there is a permanent immunity. So the recovered people will stay recover forever, which is not true for cholera, by the way. And then you might have a uh, mortality due to the disease. And then these infected people will contaminate the water, for instance, by defecating at a certain rate. And then uh, of course, bacteria can die, so they can stay in the environment for a certain time, which is uh, one divided by delta. Now, again, you can study the uh, equilibria of, of, that, um, of this model, and it comes out that you have a non-trivial equilibrium, but this non-trivial equilibrium is again feasible only if the age, which is the current capacity is larger than a certain amount. Now, you can transform that uh, inequality into, an, an, uh, into the usual expression for R naught. Why? Now, you see, number, this uh, pop, uh, beta times age is the number of susceptible people infected per unit time per bacterium. Because if you go to the population, you know, this beta is per unit time per bacterium. Okay, the, sorry, beta times S is per unit time per bacterium. So you they must introduce the mean residence, I'm sorry, mean residence time of bacteria in water, one divided by delta. And then the mean residence time in the infectious compartment. So the infectious will actually contaminate water for a certain time, which is one divided by mu plus alpha plus rho. Then they produ will produce bacteria. These bacteria will stay in, in, uh, in water for a certain time. And then the number of susceptible to unit time per bacterium is beta times age. And so you get the usual number of secondary infection produced by one primary infection. So if it is larger than one, the disease can establish. If it is more than one, the disease cannot establish. Okay, uh, I will make uh, my slides available. I had also a slide for vector-borne diseases, but you know, my time is over, so better to stop here. And I, I'll stop sharing and ask if there are some okay. final so questions. There are, there are, yes, we have, <coughs> uh, let's say a couple of questions. Um, so there are, uh, there is um, one again by Zore about the, and it was asked uh, a few minutes ago, and it was whether we can control the disease by changing the parameter rho. Now, I don't remember the notation. Uh, okay. The latency. I start uh, sharing the screen again. Okay. Share and go. So, uh, well, even here, even if you consider the basic waterborne uh, disease model, RA is the recovery rate. Mm -hmm. So, the larger the recovery rate and the smaller the residence time. Uh, wait, okay. So, if you have a small residence time, of course, R naught goes down. Uh, well, so for instance, if you can see cholera, uh, a, a simple way of, of uh, making people recover is to uh, hospitalize them and hydrate them. 
So clearly, if the recovery rate uh, is la if, if the recovery rate is larger, then the mean residence time of the infectious compartment is larger. The same if you go, okay, to, uh, for instance, uh, directly transmitted diseases, you see that again, if you consider a logistic model with the recover, recovering the recover compartment um, now uh, in evidence, you see that again, you have uh, one divided by mu plus alpha plus rho, which is the mean residence time in the infectious compartment. So if, if this rho is large, the, the time that you are infectious going down. And the same, of course, you, uh, th that is true for COVID. So if you identify people, you isolate them. Oh, well, yeah, even, even, even if they do not need to be hospitalized, but you isolate them so they are infected, but they are not infectious. Okay, so, uh, okay, that is true. There are other questions? Another, another one. Uh, there was one, um, again, on the previous part, uh, when you were talking about the transcritical bifurcation as yes. with uh, R0. Yeah. Is it possible uh, for your model to have other bifurcations like a saddle node uh, bifurcation? Where well, you know that, yes, yes. Where the not, outbreak... not, not for this model, not for this model, not for this model, but it's certainly possible. Now, transcritical by bifurcation is actually the, a critical case of saddle node bifurcation, but you have a, you can have a more general uh, saddle node bifurcation. You can have hops bifurcation. You can have a uh, subcritical or supercritical hops bifurcation. Uh, so, for instance, with um, models of schistosomiasis, that is possible, and you can also have in uh, at least the possibly, for instance, chaotic attractors. So. Uh, you might have a Feigenbaum cascade and so on. That is possible, but these are the very basic model, and here you don't have that kind of uh, that kind of bifurcation. Uh, so, in fact, uh, whenever you know people speak about R not R T R T is uh, smaller than uh, than one. Uh, okay, okay, okay. That's uh, a, you know a very simplistic approach. Uh, in a way, you you can have. Uh, much more complicated, uh, much more complicated problem. You can have instability, for instance, and so on. That, yeah, that's true. That is possible. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, You're welcome. Great. So, uh, is there any other uh, question, either here on uh, or on YouTube? Okay, so uh, thanks a lot uh, to Professor Marino Gatto for this uh, fantastic lecture. So what we're gonna do now is to uh, split in uh, breakout room, rooms while we are waiting for the next uh, um, lecture, which is gonna be actually a tutorial. Uh, and uh, we'll, uh, um, Marino Gatto will give another lecture, I believe next week, uh, if I remember by heart the program. Yes, yes, and it will be about macroparasites and schistosomiasis. Yes, so if you, I'm sure that if you have questions and any question come up, you can uh, of course ask it at the beginning uh, or during next uh, lecture. So now uh, let's take uh, uh, seven minutes. Okay, so thank you all. And Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And so, so, so see you on Monday. Yeah, thank you very much. And stay unexposed. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, great, so let's take this break. Let's take this opportunity to chat with others informally in the breakout room or stretch your legs and take a break from the screen. Thanks. <laughs>